thank you so much for joining us um, on this webinar with, with the Wilmette Institute to discuss uh, children's Baha'i literature. And um, we're just so happy to have you join us. And this morning we are joined by Linda Adier Grant and Alahi Bose. My name is Ariana Ali. I work with the Baha'i Publishing Trust. Um, so I work with both Linda and Alahe, and we're really happy to have them join us. I am going to introduce our authors and creatives today, and then they will jump right into their presentations. So today we have Linda Adie Grant. At present and alongside friends and family, Linda is working on several projects that strive to bring the lives and contributions of Baha'i heroes and heroines from around the world into the homes and hearts of our children through picture books. These precious souls are our spiritual ancestors and learning about them allows us to understand our identity as human beings on a collective journey to contribute to an ever advancing civilization. In the spring of 2020, Linda and Anna Myers created a book called I Love My Name, a book published by the US Baha'i Publishing Trust about a young 21st century girl named Tahare, who finds courage in the story of her 19th century namesake, the immortal letter of the living Tahare, whose unwavering commitment tr to truth led to her death. Earlier this year, Linda and Reina Hirano created a book called Sometimes I Made Him Laugh, a story about Saichiro Fujita, an early Japanese believer. This book published through George Ronald, shares the story of dearly loved Fujita-san and is told through the words of a youth volunteer from Papua New Guinea and shared with a young 10-year-old pilgrim from Brazil. Linda is currently working on several projects, including stories about Mula Hussein, Louis Gregory, and Thomas Breakwell. In 2021, she and Anna Myers published a book called Together Even When We're Apart in both English and Spanish. And it's about a young boy's resilient response to the COVID-19 pandemic and about the vibrant community being created in his building. Linda's academic and professional background is in anthropology and epidemiology. She lives in Decatur, Georgia, with her husband Gavin and their two children, Bahia and Thomas. Generations of her family have been transformed by the training institute process, and she loves serving alongside her neighbors and friends in activities that release the society building power of the revelation of Baha'u'llah. Her dearest hope is that her writing projects support and advance this process and the building of strong communities. Thank you, Linda, for all your work. And now to just continue on with Alahe, um, a short introduce, introduction for her. Alahe Bose has been writing, illustrating, and publishing children's books for the last 15 years. She is the founder of Plant Love Grow, where she creates and publishes stories that focus on inner growth through practical and sustainable methods and tools. With a background in applied human sciences and human relations, having studied with the Institute of Children's Literature, and now as a child behavior consultant, she brings creativity, passion, understanding, and a practical perspective to her work. Alahe was born in Zaire. She lives in, lived in Laos, and now lives in a multi-generational home in Montreal with her family. Alahi comes from a long generation of artists and loves exploring and combining new mediums, textures, and techniques. She believes in the power of stories and knows firsthand of their impact as agents of change, keepers of memories, and mostly as a source of comfort and joy for families. Her goal in every Baha'i project she has worked on has been to to bring the Baha'i writings and prayers to a young audience and make them more accessible to families. Through these stories, she hopes to help children see themselves and feel seen as Baha'is by the world around them. So thank you, Linda, for all your many years of work in children's stories. I am gonna go ahead and turn this over to them. They will share their presentations. And again, if you have any questions, post them in the Q&A box and we will go through those at the end. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. Um, it's such a, an honor for me to be here, and I'm very grateful for this opportunity. Uh, children's books have played such a big part in my life, and uh, I know some of you might be interested in the process or might 
be writing your own book and stories. And there is so much that we can both share and uh, we have such a short time to do it. So we're just going to share a little bit and we'd be happy to answer your questions later on. I have a small uh, PowerPoint, so it's just going to guide me as I present. So basically, uh, my name is, as I was introduced, Elahe Boss. I'm an author. I'm also an illustrator and a publisher of children's books. And you can find my work uh, on these two websites. And the way I wanted to you know, focus on this presentation was through the questions I ask myself when I am working or illustrating a children's books. And through these questions, I will kind of guide you a little bit through my process. So the first thing I always focus on is what is my intention? What is the image that comes to mind when I think of this project of this book? And when I worked on, on Baha'i Prayers for Children, what came to mind was this image of really you know, reading the prayers with my children. And I think a lot of people will relate to that personal need as a parent or as a teacher, where we see that we want to share a very specific experience and we don't necessarily have the right tools for it. So that was really my main goal. And the, the stronger this intention is and the clearer this picture is, the more it will guide you through your own personal process as you create your own stories. And I also want to always focus on what types of connections uh, the book can, can help create. So when I was working on, you know, on a lot of these little board books, what I was really focusing on um, was that connection between parent and child. But before that even was that connection between God and us through the writing and really bringing it at a level where a child can have almost that direct connection through, through the writing. And in order to do that, it meant like really focusing on much shorter selection and also selections that were at a level where a young child could could get to that that beautiful, inspiring source of the words uh, in a way that they can they can feel like this is for them only. And then again, the connection between parent and child, because when children are young, it is really through the you know, the actions of the parent coming to read to the child, sitting with a child and, you know, saying a prayer together, learning a prayer together. So for me, those connections are always very important um, in terms of the books. The other types of connections that we get is the connections between author and illustrator or co-authors or working with a publishing company or, or the High Publishing Trust. And we get to learn so much through that process. So here I have, for example, Mason's Greatest Gems, which is um, a collaboration sorry, with uh, Chelsea Lee Smith. And that one is about, you know, mining our inner gems, which are our virtues. And the other one is a collaboration with Esther Maloney, which is Love, Virtue, Freedom, which is about life after death. So these two books are a way for us to share Baha'i principles with everybody. And they have been used uh, as part of children's classes. They have been used through celebrations. They have been used in school. And it's a wonderful way to share the Baha'i teachings with others through stories and, um, and also teaching concepts such as life after death through a story. And the process of working with someone else is very rewarding, but it's also a process where we learn a lot and we, you know, get to grow as a writer, as an artist, as an illustrator. So especially if you're in the beginning of your career, it's a very rewarding process to, to look into. <clears throat> um, the other thing I look at is what experiences can this book help facilitate? So one of the needs that, um, that I kept seeing over and over was uh, a need but expressed by a lot of parents of young children who wanted to to share, you know, Ayamiha especially with their, uh, their children's teachers at the school. There were opportunities for them to, to go into the classroom and, you know, they wanted tools for that. So this idea of a very simple, you know, book came in mind and it's very, it's very straightforward in terms of what we do during Ayamiha. So 
You know, it goes during Ayami Ha, we celebrate with flowers and garlands and decorations we create. During Ayami Ha, we sprinkle love. We share our blessings from God above. During Ayami Ha, we show we care. When we work together, there's more to share. And this book really became uh, something that was very easy for parents to show to the teachers beforehand, get permission from the school to share the story, to share the book you know, in the classroom. And then it became something that the parents could give as a gift to the teacher. So that process for me was a way of really creating something that could be uh, a way of sharing, you know, what our celebrations of and, and what we love to, to celebrate and strengthening Baha'i identity. Because when a child finds a book that is specific to a celebration that they do, and that they have in their family and in their community, it's very, it's such a, a very powerful experience for them. You know, it makes them feel seen. It makes them feel like they belong to something so much bigger than themselves. And it's a very rewarding experience where they feel like they can bring and share something of theirs uh, in their classroom. And, you know, like as someone who really didn't grow up with a lot of books like that, I know that that's something I wanted to 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 help, you know, put out there is more and more tools and resources for parents when it comes to our celebration and to, you know, creating tools that help with uh, strengthening Baha'i identity. And in talking about the process and the experience, you know, like, uh, for example, this book came as a desire to have something to give as a gift. So it's been given to people in hospital, it's been given to people who are in different uh, circumstances. And it's really quotes about love. And it's, for me, um, one thing I find very powerful is sharing the writings in a way that is, you know, is it shares my love for the writing through the book. So when I, I illustrate something, it's just kind of a way for me to, to say thank you and, and to share that thanks through the art, through the work and through putting that, into you know a book format um another thing that came you know like comfort comfort is a big thing uh so creating materials that that help with comfort that's uh, something for me the other thing was you know sharing gifts of love and joy so a dinosaur for yamaha for example it's it's really a, a story of of joy and love and it's uh, about a little boy who who sees this dinosaur and he's just so excited and he wants to get it because his grandma told him he can pick a toy for Ayamiha. And when he goes back with her to get it, it's gone. And so he's kind of a little bit sad, but throughout his day, as he's doing all this other stuff for Ayamiha, he realizes that it's been such a wonderful experience that, you know, even without the dinosaur, you can have a, a great day. And just as he goes to visit, you know, the last neighbor uh, to give, you know, they run out of cookies. So he decides to give his own cookies to the neighbor as a way of making him feel better and sharing Ayamiha. And it turns out that that neighbor had bought him the dinosaur that he wants, you know. So it's it's really just about joy and and sharing things from a perspective of a child who is just explaining his day and going through his day through yeah, you know, through his own experience of uh, of Ayamiha. So one thing that is very important is uh, bringing our personal voice to a topic or a book or project. And uh, one question I get sometimes is, you know, people tell me, oh, I, I want to do a project about virtues, but there are, you know, 50,000 other books on virtues should I do it? Should I not do it? Should I look for something else? Like, is there a topic that no one has talked about? I don't think there is. I think one thing that's really important is that we bring our own personal style, perspective, experience, point of view, artistic style. We make our own choices. And we basically, through our own personal experience, will give the same topic a very different um, frame in which some people will relate to differently. So for example, these are two of my books about kindness. 
you know so one is very straightforward which is example of kindness the other one is looking at how we spend our time and how when we spend our time you know adding kindness to what we do it becomes so much bigger so uh, and and there are thousands and thousands of other books on kindness out there but my point is really as an aspiring author or illustrator is not to look at what other people are doing but to say what is unique to me what is unique to my experience what is unique to my perspective and how do i do this differently and really lean into that as much as we can when we create our books rather than trying to look at what is out there and doing the same thing that is out there but really focusing on what we can do differently and what's uh, unique to us um, one thing that's very important as well is I look for uh, representation in the work that I do. And I try to, to bring representation through my illustrations. So these are, you know, all part of uh, Crown My Head, which is a Baha'i children's book. And so I will try to occasionally have, uh, you know, if I can also show disability, show multiculturalism, show... Um, you know, children of different ages, the children that look different, but that look like every child we've seen wearing regular clothes and, and, you know, finding a way to do it for me. It's always about, you know, can every child see themselves or see a version of themselves in this story? And uh, that's, uh, that's something that's very important, of course. And my last point is really... Um, that's something that's, again, very personal for me, is how do I make this as accessible as possible and as uh, suited to the intended audience that I'm creating a book for? So there are, you know, children's books are, it's, it can be such a wide range, whether you're working with uh, toddlers, with board books, with young reader format with early chapter book. So it's important to know um, what is your intent, who is your intended audience and how to basically cater what it is that you're creating to that intended audience. So the first thing that often um, comes to mind is the selection of content. You know, so if I'm going to have something uh, with the writings themselves, you know, I will try to look at, okay, you know, what is the age range that, uh, that I'm looking for that will impact the length of the quotation that I use, that will impact the content sometimes or the selection, or if I'm going to put, you know, one prayer in it or two prayer in it. So depending on, um, you know, the selection of content, I know what type of book I'm creating. But the language, you know, that means... Uh, are there words that are really difficult? Are there words that the child can understand based on the whole sentence around it without necessarily needing additional explanation? Uh, because we are working with, um, with writings that have such beautiful language, sometimes it can be a little challenging to, to see and, and to really bring the writing to, to a younger audience. And that's always my goal is how do I bring the writing to, to children as young as possible so that it becomes part of their, their growing up and the natural process of their learning. Of course, the, the length, if I'm writing a story myself, that will impact the writing style. So how long my story is, the type of words I will use in the story, the flow of the story, the, the style of the story. So again, the word choice, and then we're looking at the, the more technical aspects. And those are really also important because uh, what is so great about, you know, board books like this is young children can, can take them, can use them, and, and they don't get destroyed. And one thing that would happen a lot of time is, you know, you would see a parent trying to, to read a prayer with their child, and then they almost have to, like, hold the book further away, especially if they weren't, it wasn't their book and they were trying to, you know, have the child involved, but the child not ripping the book. And, and it's a very hard process as a parent when you want to include your child in a celebration, but you don't want them to, to damage the book. And it's, 
it's so important to to think about these things because we need to create um, material in the formats that is age appropriate to the, for the children. So board books are really a great, great, great things for children, you know, under the age of five, because then they can really open the book and be be themselves without worrying about their little fingers and you know, like smudges or things like that. It's it's a beautiful thing to see. Um, and then the size of the book, uh, your illustration choices. For me personally, I always try to create illustrations that focus on feeling rather than, uh, you know, try to, because the writings are, are, are so wide and they can be interpreted in so many ways. So when I create an illustration, I really try to look at what is the feeling that I want you know, this sentence to bring, or what is the feeling that I want the child to have when they read this? And, or, or what I think the feeling that I get from this, uh, this part of the writing and, and to share that through the illustration. And then you will probably, you know, look at the publishing options that are available to you, which means getting it published, publishing it yourself, uh, looking for a collaboration for the process, and, you know, price is also a key point because we want our children to and the families to have access and to make things uh, as accessible as possible and the marketing itself. Because so these are all kind of things that will come into play when I'm looking at uh, creating a children's books. So that's pretty much um, you know, the, the gist of what I wanted to present and to really say that uh, there is no wrong way of, of doing it. Some people will start with the story. Some people will start with the illustration. Some people will start, uh, you know, however they need to start. And there's a, a lot of beautiful, beautiful, beautiful books for children out there. And uh, that's it. So I really hope that this was helpful some way. And I personally can't wait to hear what Linda will say as well. So this is, uh, this is it for me. And uh, I'll be happy to answer questions when you have them, if you have some for me after. Thank you, Elahe. Wow, I am so inspired. Oh my goodness. I'm almost speechless because I, I just, yeah, I have loved Elahe for so long and I'm so grateful to the Wilmette Institute for um, introducing us. So we got to know each other better personally and also for putting together this program this weekend that um, is such a wonderful opportunity for all of us to come together to think about writing and um, the process of writing and what, what books mean for us. Um, this session especially is, is very close to my heart. I don't have as much experience as Elahe. Um, it's just been in the past few years that I've gotten super excited about um, uh, children's literature. And I also have uh, a small set of slides that I'm going to share. That I think will just help me like stay on track. So um, so we're talking this morning, Allah has, I almost feel like I'm not sure quite what to share after all of that. But our theme, um, as Allah had mentioned, is to create engaging stories and devotional content for young children and their families. And even though we can't see you, I feel confident that, you know, you're coming to a session that's about children um, and, and creating materials for children, um, that there is a, a love in your hearts for children and a recognition of the role that they play um, in general and in each of our communities. Um, most likely some of you have come across this passage before written by um, the Universal House of Justice, the elected um, body that serves the Baha'i community. The Universal House of Justice in the year 2000 um, wrote uh, a, a letter to the, the Baha'is of the world. And in that letter, there are several paragraphs about uh, children and the the situation of children in the world and our responsibility towards children. So just to start, um, just to start out these you know, few minutes that I'm going to be sharing some comments, I wanted to read this paragraph because um, I think it, I think it really, it, it, I think it really informs 
like both the priority on children's literature and also the attitude and the posture we as you know creators of materials for children um, should aspire to have. The Universal House of Justice wrote, children are the most precious, are the most precious treasure a community can possess. For in them are the promise and guarantee of the future. They bear the seeds of the character of future society, which is largely shaped by what the adults constituting the community do or fail to do with respect to children. They are a trust no community can neglect with impunity. An all-embracing love of children, the manner of treating them, the quality of attention shown them, the spirit of adult behavior toward them, these are all among the vital aspects of the requisite attitude. So I found that I find this paragraph so inspiring and it, it has um, every project that I've been a part of, like I, I really try to like do my best to try to um, be responsive to this vision of the House of Justice. And several parts of this passage particularly like touch my heart. One is that the, the ch- that our children are a treasure. Um, and then another concept that really touches my heart is that it's not just what we do as adults, but it's also what we potentially fail to do with respect to children. So what opportunities do we potentially miss to ensure that our children are nurtured? And then finally, this last paragraph that talks about an all-embracing love. And I, I think, you know, before I was writing, I thought of this as, you know, how to inform like when I interact with children, whether it's in a children's class or just in the community or, you know, out and about how we interact with children. I think also since I've started writing and thinking about children, I, I think it also applies to how we write and how we create materials and how we, um, you know, create like um, prayer books as Allah was mentioning, like this attitude that we have, this love that we have this attention that we show them. So I'm, I want to include a, a photograph of a group of children that's especially close to my heart. Uh, it was in this, it was you know participating in a children's class in a neighborhood not far from where we live that I first really saw the power of stories. Um, you know, the training institute, the, edu- the, the part of the training institute, the educational program that's for children, um, it has is is so it's such a central part of the curriculum is about stories, and I saw in this class like how much these children, how much they loved the stories that were in the curriculum, both the stories of Abdul Baha for sure, who became a hero for them, but also the stories that are also included in the grade one curriculum of the children's class about other heroes and heroines of the faith. So I wanted to share before going in a little bit about some of the projects that I've had the chance to work on, just to share a few thoughts about storytelling. Um, and I have, there are three, there are just three concepts that I wanted to just to spend a minute on each one. Uh, one is the centrality of stories to the educational programs of the Institute, to our children's classes that we have all over the world. Um, I also wanted to talk a little bit about storytelling as an art And then finally, the role of storytelling as um, a way um, by which our identity, our identity with regard to who we are is nurtured. So first, um, storytelling is um, central to the Institute's programs for children. Uh, Many of you all are, um, have participated as children or are teachers or your children are in children's classes and know that in the, um, in the curriculum, the grade one curriculum, you know, alongside uh, prayers and learning, uh, learning writings, memorizing writings and playing games and doing coloring and learning songs, each lesson, each of the 24 lessons of the of grade one in the Institute is accompanied by um, a story. And um, I, I wanted to share like, in the, in the materials that help us become teachers, like in the 
in the materials that kind of orient us and train us to become teachers of children's classes, there's two beautiful sections that kind of put storytelling in perspective. And even though this is like oral story- storytelling, I think it really applies to the stories that we write as well. And so I think we could learn a lot from sort of the experiences that have built around sharing stories uh, through the Institute process. So this is uh, from Ruhi book one, which is the training course that helps us become teachers. So in that book, there is this guidance. Above all, you should remember that you are not play acting and that your feelings must be sincere. Youngsters can easily detect a lack of sincerity. What is desired is to connect with the hearts of children And remember, this is the section, I just want to make sure that this is the section that's helping us learn how to tell stories well, learning, uh, helping us to build capacity as teachers to tell stories. And I'm I'm sharing this because I think it will also help us as, as authors and as illustrators. So I'll start from the beginning. Above all, you should remember that you are not play acting and that your feelings must be sincere. Youngsters can easily detect a lack of sincerity. What is desired is to connect with the hearts of children and to carry on the long-standing tradition of storytelling through which for millennia now, the store of wisdom acquired by humanity has been passed from one generation to the next. So I just wanted to highlight those two concepts from this, from this passage. One is the importance of sincerity in all the work that we do to create materials for children. And then the other is just this amazing like um, understanding that the stories that we all are writing and that we're creating are, this is what humanity has done for millennia. And it's, it's a way by which each generation um, receives like the love and the wisdom of the one that came before it. Storytelling is also an art, you know, for sure when it's oral. And I think also for sure when it's, you know, stories are written and prepared. Um, and I wanted to share, this is now a passage from, uh, you know, we, we've, we've always known the arts are very important, but in the most recent message of the Universal of Justice um, that was sent at the end of last year, they talked about the arts. And for me, this, this section of the, it's from the December, a message written December 30th, uh, 2021. And I could share the link for anyone who's interested in the totality of the message. Uh, but there is a section where the Universal of Justice talks about the arts and um, the importance of the arts. And I, I found it really interesting and it really, I got really excited about thinking about books and children's books specifically as an art and thinking about what the House of Justice tells us um, that the arts are able to accomplish. So the House of Justice writes, indeed, the arts as a whole, so integral a part of the development of a community from the start, stand out in such settings as an important means of generating joy, of strengthening bonds of unity, of disseminating knowledge, and consolidating understanding, as well as acquainting those in the wider society with the principles of the cause. And I kind of tried to remember, it's been a long time since I was a child, but I tried to remember some of the books that I really remembered. And I, so many of these things, I think when I, there are two books that I remember very well from when I was a child. One is called, maybe some of you remember it as well. It's called The Wonder Lamp. And it was a story written by the hand of the cause, Mr. Fazy, and it's about progressive revelation. And then another story that I can't find anywhere, but it's called The The book is called The Gift, and it's about a dove who brings a book, and then these animals are, you know, um, they're warring with each other, but then the book is, the dove reminds them that the book is meant to bring them unity. So these two books, I haven't seen the books in decades, but thinking back, you know, I think the reason why these books, even now, all these years later, I still remember them, um, is because they they did these things for me. <laughs> they created joy in my heart. They disseminated knowledge about progressive revelation and about uh, the role of the word of God. And I think they consolidated my understanding in a way that even now, when I sometimes I find myself when I'm explaining progressive revelation, I find myself referring to the concepts that I first learned 
from that story. So I, I mentioned those exam personal examples to kind of like remind ourselves that like the arts are able to like um, often like create a depth, like leave an imprint in our heart that maybe is not really possible without the arts. So um, I think that's, it, it made me like doubly excited to be involved in uh, especially uh, children's books that have illustrations, which are so, I mean, the art is like such, is so central to, to the book. Okay, then, then the last, the last theme I wanted to spend a little bit of time about with, the last, before I talk a little bit about some of the projects that I've been a part of, is about our identity. And this is an area that I'm also really excited about the role of stories. Um, maybe I'll share the quote first, and then I'll share some comments. So the, uh, the, Okay, I'll share the quote. <laughs> this is what, first of all, the background of this, this is now from uh, another book in the Training Institute. This is from Ruhi Book 7, which is the, you know, book three helps us to become teachers of children's classes. And book seven helps us to become uh, tutors of study circles. So in book seven, I know that many of you all have studied it, but I just had the chance in the past year to kind of relook at book seven because we were having like a refresher course for tutors and there is uh, one sec there's there's a part of book seven um, where each of the pre each of the books of the sequence of courses we sort of learn like a little bit more about like what the purpose of that book. So there's one section that talks about the purpose of book four, and book four is all about stories. It's stories about the twin manifestations about the Bob and Baha'u'llah, and in the sections that talk about book four. Um, the materials kind of tell us that it's through stories and through history that we understand our identity. And so since the books, you know, as Ariana mentioned in the introduction, the books that I'm mostly working on are biographies of heroes and heroines. This really attracted me and really got me excited because we know how important it is that we have an understanding, especially our children, have an understanding of their identity and who they are. Okay, so now I'll share this passage from uh, Ruhi Book 7 about um, the role of history and the role of this role stories play in developing our identity. Okay, history shapes much of the identity of the individual as well as entire peoples. When connection with history is severed, confusion sets in and people become as rootless trees. I found this so powerful. I'm gonna just read it one more time. History shapes much of the identity of the individual as well as entire peoples. When connection with history is severed, confusion sets in and people become as rootless trees. But where we may ask during this age of transition in the life of humanity, when the old order is disintegrating and a new creation is appearing in its place, is each person to find the historical roots of his or her existence? This is a difficult question for most, but for Baha'is, the answer is simple enough. We must seek the elements of our identity in the myriad events that have brought the cause of God forward from that fateful evening when the Bab declared his mission to Mullah Hussein. And this is the section, if you want to look for it, it's in Ruhi Book 7, Section 15 of Unit 2. So given that my interest in, you know, the, the sort of like the projects that I've been working on have been um, biographies of individuals from history, um, we have one book about Tahereh and one about Fujita, um, which I'll, I'll share a little bit more about those books, but you know, trying to understand why is it important for a child to understand who Tahereh was? Is it just a nice story or is it actually something that can um, um, create in a child a better understanding of who they are as a human being by knowing the story of Tahereh and other heroes and heroines um, of the faith? So I'm going to share just a little bit now about some of the projects that I have um, been a part of. Ariana mentioned at the beginning, so I'll I'll be a, I'll be a little bit brief. Um, one book that uh, together with Anna Myers we created um, a few years back was called "I Love My Name," and it is about 
a young girl. And it, this, this book, especially, I think really, um, I really was thinking of that passage from Ruhi book seven, when this book was being written and trying to think like, what does, what, what does it mean that taught that how, how could knowing the story of Tahre make our lives different um, here in the, in this century. So this book is about a girl who's actually named Tahre. She's named after Tahre and she really loves her name. She loves everything about it. Um, and she, uh, one day like has a difficult time because someone's teasing her about her name. And so she kind of questions things and she turns to her teacher and her teacher very wisely um, accompanies her to learn more about who she's named after. And in the process of learning about the original Tahre, she develops a courage and a, a deeper love for her name and a deeper understanding of who Tahre was and and she then is sort of able to like um, address the teasing that's happening from her friends kind of as, as like uh, at, with, the, with the understanding that comes from what Tahira did and the courage that she exhibited. Um, more recently, uh, together with uh, Rina Herano, we created a book called Sometimes I Made Him Laugh. And this book is about someone that um, I think many people, I've, I've, I've found that many people, I was really surprised at how many people actually remember meeting him on pilgrimage. He passed away in the 1970s. But if people who went on pilgrimage before that, um, it just seemed like everyone remembered him because he was such an important part of their pilgrimage. So Sachiro Fujita was a Baha'i from Japan. He was the second Baha'i, um, second believer from Japan. And he met Abdu'l-Bahá as a teenager when Abdu'l-Bahá was in America. And he traveled with Abdu'l-Bahá and eventually he actually served. Um, he served Abdu'l-Bahá at the Baha'i World Center. Um, he lived a very long life and he also served under the Guardian and under the Universal House, you know, he served the Universal House of Justice until his passing in the 1970s. And his story really, really resonated with me. The, the, it, the, this little boy here is actually the main character of the book and his name is Paolo and he's a young boy on pilgrimage. And while he's on pilgrimage, he learns the story of Fujita. And the third book that I'm just going to mention briefly because it's it doesn't really fall on the same theme in terms of like heroes and heroines of the faith, but it's a book that um, again with Anna Myers we were like inspired to write during the COVID pandemic, and it was written in, uh, that first summer in 2020. You know we were receiving these amazing, powerful letters from the Universal House of Justice that were really putting into perspective what was happening at this moment in time for the human race. And th those messages were, were such a contrast to what we were hearing on the news in, in terms of the House of Justice was providing us with so much hope and such clarity about what our response should be, both as individuals and as communities in terms of being of service. Uh, so this book is about a young boy. He's here in the corner in this upper with his parents. This little boy, his name is Amari. He's eight years old and he he copes with the pandemic. Mean, he kind of, he, he's resilient in the face of the pandemic because he's of service uh, to the people who are around him. And his neighbors also similarly um, exhibit uh, a posture of service to one another and they come together and their community becomes more vibrant. So I just wanted to share now about kind of in general um, about all of these projects, like just to speak a little bit more like generally about some of the like specifics. Um, hopefully there are people here who are, you know, thinking about writing a book who maybe have started a draft. And I, I hope that during the questions and answers we can hear from you, um, but we thought maybe it'd be helpful to like share some of the um, approaches that like we took in thinking about um, who to write about and how to make the stories relatable and where to get ideas from and what the process of writing and collaboration was like. So in terms of who to write about, I think there are so many interesting um, individuals. Uh, the first book we wrote about was Tahre, and that was actually because in that children's class, I showed you the picture of at the beginning, um, you know, the children were really interested in Tahre. You know, in one of the lessons, they learned about Tahre, and they, they just wanted to know more. And so, sort of that book is really written as like a kind of really an honor of those children, because 
they um, they loved what they learned in the in the lesson itself, but their desire to have more um, led led our team to kind of want to like create a picture book that they could read and share with their families. Um, in terms of then this question of how to make the stories relatable when you're writing about history, like I'm, I'm sure there are like so many different ideas, and I really love what Allah has said about you know each of us is we need lots of books about everyone. Like we need to have hundreds of books about Tahara and hundreds of books about Fujita. Like, I think that's like one thing that's helped me a lot is knowing that we're not writing the book about any of these individuals because they, um, their contributions are so vast that we need many, many individuals to think about how their stories can be shared. Uh, so one strategy that that, that we used for both of these books, because we don't know that much about Tahereh's childhood, and we don't know that much about Fujita's childhood. And my experience with our own children is that um, children really relate to other children. And so both of these books are sort of written to be like a story within a story. Um, so they both have like, they start out like the first page is like a modern kid, like a modern kid who's like, named after Tahara, like a modern kid who's from Brazil and going on pilgrimage. Uh, and then within that, that story, um, they, they then learn the story of Tahara and of Fujita. And th this is just one strategy. I'm, I'm, I bet that there are many, many other strategies to kind of like allow like a child to kind of relate maybe to what it's like when you're when your name is a little bit different than other people or in the case of Paolo, like what it's like to like be on pilgrimage and, you know, kind of be like in the gardens. And so I think that um, that strategy, I, I, I hope has been like helpful in, in, in helping children be able to relate to the main character. And then in each of the stories, I really try, and I learned this from the lessons of the children's classes in the Institute is like, I always like try to have in my mind, like a theme, like something that I really would love, like at the end for the child, like a, a feeling or a spiritual capacity that could be strengthened. So in the case of um, I Love My Name and for Tahara, you know, I, I just, ever since I was little, you know, I always just thought the courage of Tahara to do what she did when she did it was so inspiring to me. So I tried to think of like a, a way that, you know, here, like here we are in like 2002, like what does it look like to be courageous now? And maybe one way is to, um, in the face of being teased, to stay brave and to stay strong and not to, you know, lash out in being angry, but to be forgiving and all of those things. So that was sort of the theme of I Love My Name was to like be courageous. And then for I Love My Name, uh, I wish I could talk more about Fujita, but hopefully you all will Google him. And if you don't know about him, learn more. It was such a joy to learn about Sachiro Fujita. He was very obedient. He wanted to go to Haifa right away as soon as he met Abdul Baha, but Abdul Baha um, advised him to stay in America and to finish his studies, which he did in obedience. Um, eventually, though, he was called to come to Haifa and he did so much for Abdul Baha. He was involved in so many different things. Um, but when asked how he served Abdul Baha, one time someone asked him, what did you do? Like, what was your role for Abdul Baha? Like, in what way did you serve? And um, he said, I never felt that I did very much for Abdul Baha, but sometimes I made him laugh. And it was, I just found that, um, I found that I found that uh, that hum humility and that sweetness of that response of Fujita to be so powerful. Um, and so that's where the title, Sometimes I Made Him Laugh, comes from. Uh, okay, in terms of ideas, um, I'm just gonna try to finish these things on this slide and then I'm almost done. Um, ideas, I think, I think we all, like, I think when we're writing books and I probably this is the case for all, everyone on here who's writing or preparing materials for children. It's so exciting to get ideas from just all around us, from our own children, from the children in our neighborhood, from the families. Um, you know, so this little boy, Paolo, for example, he, um, he really likes to make people laugh too. And that really was something that I really 
learn from my son who in every situation, he always tries to see if he could like bring joy and like tell a joke or make people happy. Um, and I love my name. My daughter also isn't named Tahra, but is named Bahia and has also had, really loves her name and is always writing it in different ways. And, you know, sometimes has been asked, you know, to spell her name. And so seeing how she has like kind of navigated the world with like a, a very precious name, but also a name that's, you know, hard to spell or hard to say. Um, so ideas from like my own children's life and from the lives of, you know, children around me have impacted the books. Um, and then finally, just a few comments about the process of writing and collaboration. And I really echo what Allah has said. I mean, the joy, like I think sometimes we think that writing is a very isolating um, enterprise. And I found it to be quite the opposite <laughs> I, um, compared to other things I've done um, like in my life professionally, like I find it to be very, very um, uplifting in terms of the collaboration. Uh, one thing that I think is nice to mention, and there's gonna be a whole session on, you know, like, not a whole session, but like one of the sessions tomorrow, there'll be someone from the review office. And I found like that process to be really exciting. Um, and really I learned a lot about um, like the importance. I mean, I knew it was important, but I think my, my appreciation for like the, the, the high, high um, priority that we must have on um, historical accuracy and like the extent to which things are like, you know, the review office helps authors who submit for Baha'i review and how important it is, that process. Um, I, I don't know, I'm, I'm very humbled, I guess, before the process of review. And I'm so grateful um, to have had that opportunity to learn like how it is approached. Um, of course, the opportunity to work with publishers, it was such a joy. <laughs> like I, um, it was kind of magical to see like something come from, you know, black and white on a piece of paper and a Google document, all of a sudden, like these beautiful books to be created. And so that was a real uh, joy collaborating with um, the publishers. And of course, you could imagine, like, I feel like children's picture books are 99% about the images and maybe 1% about the words. I don't know exactly what the percentages is, but it's heavy on the illustration. So I feel um, beyond like honored to have worked both with Anna um, on I Love My Name and with Rena on um, Sometimes I Made Him Laugh. And I, I, I wish I could draw like that. It is truly magical. And I have such awe and respect. And the process of collaboration was so exciting. I think it was lots of back and forth and lots of learning. Okay, so I think my last two slides, uh, I just wanted to like share um, just two thoughts. One is about the importance of like ourselves as writers growing. I feel like since I started writing, um, maybe it's been three years or four years, I feel like um, I feel it's been such a precious opportunity for me to really think about my own spiritual qualities, um, especially going back to that uh, passage from the House of Justice about the attitude we have towards children. So I, um, I wanted to just like kind of end with this question really to all to myself first, but really to all of us who are writing materials for children and for others, how can we as writers, what are those spiritual qualities that we can strengthen in ourselves so that we can write stories that are worthy of the precious children who are being raised by communities that are applying the framework of the nine-year plan. You know, the, the message I mentioned earlier, I know many of you all have read it, December 30th, 2021, 20, uh, the House of Justice describes the enkindled souls that are being raised by this plan and the qualities that they have. And to, to think that like, you know, among those enkindled souls are children, this precious treasure. And, um, uh, thinking of those souls, you know, many of whom I, we'd, we'll never meet, right? Our books have this opportunity to have this, you know, reach beyond people that we actually will get to know in person. But how is it that we can develop our spiritual quality so that the stories elevate, you know, are elevated in such a way that they are like consistent with these, these, these souls, these tender souls that are being raised up within the nine-year plan, um, so just as a few examples, 
you know, what is it, what does it look like? You know, Elahe talked about collaboration and I mentioned it as well. You know, what does collaboration look like in this environment as we're producing literature? Uh, what is what does it look like to be free of prejudice and of paternalism? Like, how do we do that as writers? Um, how do we have a posture of humility and remain eager to learn? You know, the House Justice talks about like we 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 have learned things, but there's still much to learn. And how do we remain in that posture of humility that will allow us to um, to take those steps that are needed to continue to grow? Okay, and then the remaining two minutes, I just, you know, I think one of the things that was um, mentioned in the, in the description was, you know, like, how do we bring our projects to completion? You know, I, I, I feel like this is something that I really want to learn more about from Elahe and from others, you know, like, so, so you, you sometimes feel like some of these, like, you think about Tahir, or you think about Fujita, like, they're so noble and their lives were so immense. You kind of, you, you kind of sometimes just want to keep learning about them and keep, keep like making the writing more clear or keep working on the illustrations or, you know, but at some point you want to also like bring it to some closure. So what does that look like? And I think that that's like, for me, that's something that I'm like really eager to learn more about is how do you balance like excellence and wanting to always like, make it better and better, but also at some point saying, okay, for now, this is, this is like where we are, you know, and this is, we'll, we'll, we're going to like publish this book. And so that's something that I think is something, maybe it just comes as you, maybe it comes with time. And so a few ideas just around like very practical things that have helped me to keep momentum and to complete projects. I think one is just to be around children as much as possible. And if that, if that means teaching a children's class or just you know, being in parks and just having conversations with children, I think it really has helped me tremendously kind of just know what's in the minds and hearts of children. The other has been consulting with others at every stage, whether it's brainstorming about ideas, circulating drafts, um, just at every stage, I think consultation we know bestows understanding. Uh, seeking inspiration everywhere, reading all kinds of books, children's books, other kinds of books. And I think, you know, finally, keeping Abdu'l-Baha close always. Uh, we just are finishing this amazing centenary year where we had the opportunity to keep Abdul Baha so close to our hearts. And, you know, I think remembering his, his love for children and his um, liberal use of stories to explain truth, uh, I think is, um, I think as writers, especially for children, keeping Abdul Baha close to our hearts and our minds really helps facilitate our work. So in closing, I just wanted to share this prayer that um, is, is, is a source of great inspiration and guidance to me. And then after this, we're going to move into having questions. O oh, thou kind Lord, these lovely children are the handiwork of the fingers of thy might and the wondrous signs of thy greatness. O oh, God, protect these children graciously assist them to be educated and enable them to render service to the world of humanity. Oh God, these children are pearls. Cause them to be nurtured within the shell of thy loving kindness. Thou art the bountiful, the all loving. Okay, thank you so much, um, Linda and Alahe, for your presentations. Um, for anyone who logged in a little late, my name is Ariana. I work with the U.S. Baha'i Publishing Trust. Um, and so we're just so grateful to do this collaboration today with the Wilmette Institute and with Alahe and Linda. Um, thank you for sharing your wonderful presentations. Um, as I mentioned, so we're now we're going to go through a few questions and answers if you have anything else to add, um, any questions or comments, post them in Q&A, and we'll try to go through them for all of you. Um, and then I also forgot to mention at the very beginning that we have a very brief poll that we're going to post in the chat at the end. It's just two questions for some feedback. So if you have just one extra minute to just um, share some feedback with us, we'd really appreciate that. Um, 
So let's see what has come through. We'll do our best to get through these. Um, so the first question is from Marion Rich. Um, thank you for having this. Our question is what role is there with the publishing trust for authors of a traditionally published award-winning picture books? We have so many children's publishing connections and want to build a bridge to the high topics and stories. Um, so yeah, I don't know if I have an exact answer for this. I'll try answering a little bit and then allow hey and Linda, if you have any comments just about collaborating with the publishing trust. Um, we really are always open to talking and um, collaborating with authors, illustrators, whether you publish through the publishing trust or even just distribute your books through us, that's also a possibility. Um, so, you know, we work with independently published authors and illustrators as well. Um, so we're really open to talking. I'll also just put my email in the chat box. If anyone has a question directly for the Baha'i Publishing Trust, feel free to email me and you know our team will try to get back to you with questions. Um, but so yeah, Linda or Alahe, if you have any thoughts about like collaborations, you know, between authors, illustrators, the publishing trusts, et cetera, wow. um, that you'd like to share, please go ahead. Well, first, I just want to say how much I enjoy Linda's presentation. So thank you, Linda. That was really, really inspiring. Um, I think it really depends on what you want to bring to the table. And, you know, obviously, if you're you know, if you've created uh, an award-winning picture book, I'm sure whatever you contact them about is going to be something interesting and, and they can only answer based on that. So even if it's just to share your process, your information, what it is that you want to do, you know, I would definitely contact them and maybe even go to the panel discussion where you can ask, you know, a multitude of questions because that will be really a wonderful way to access these resources and and you know all the people who are directly involved in the process so. okay thank you um there's also a question will the presenter slides shows be available to us in some format yes this is recorded so um these will be published i think on the wilmette institute um youtube page we can also put in the Baha'i Bookstore YouTube page. Um, but yeah, everything will be available afterward. Everything's recorded. So it will be um, there to see. Um, we have a direct question for Alahe next. Your books are beautiful, fresh and charming. You're amazing in your versatile skills, being able to write, illustrate, design, and publish. I understand how you create your books, how do you choose a printer and manage the business side? That's that's a very big question. You know, thank you for for asking it because I, I think the first step would be to find out what your options are. So researching what options are available out there. So whether that is you know standard traditional publishing or publishing through self publishing or even locally printing your books uh, directly from a, a printer who lives you know, two streets down and, and then carrying a, a huge inventory yourself. So those are usually kind of the three main options and researching what each one of them might mean and how much time and energy each one of them demands on you. Um, you know, like traditional publishing kind of allows you to once the book is done to really kind of support the process, but from a, a, a bit of a separation point where they will kind of take over once the book is published and then you can kind of help support that. When you do uh, self-publishing, you are really in charge of the process yourself, which means the editing, the marketing, the publishing, all of that, and, and creating the platform for your own marketing. And so is the third option, which is printing your books locally. So that means, you know, uh, paying for those books, usually in a large quantity, so you can reduce the cost and also carrying that inventory and then figuring out a way of selling it. So the first thing I would say is kind of do some research in terms of what option, what each option means, and then decide how much time and energy 
you are willing to put into, into a project. Uh, there is something really wonderful, especially if you are at the beginning of your career of getting the support of a publishing house, because you will learn a lot through that process. If, uh, if this is a book that maybe this is your seventh book that you've done and, and you really have a vision for 12 more and you already have your website, then it's a very different situation. So those are kind of looking at all of the, the elements, you know, and then deciding afterwards. And also one thing that could be really interesting is just consulting with different people who have done different types of publishing and asking your questions, you know, like, what does this mean? Uh, how was this process? And then you can kind of see what you want to do. I think also each situation is different because if you are an author and an illustrator, you know, then you don't have to find an illustrator, work in an, with an illustrator. If you are just an author, the publishing house will connect you with an illustrator. And, and so there's a lot of support that you can get by submitting it to a, a traditional publishing house, which is usually often the first step. Um, a lot of times people will lo look at alternate options if their book was not accepted. And that it doesn't mean it's not a good book. It just means that it didn't meet the necessary criteria at the time of, or what they were looking for. So a lot of people will look at, you know, different options after that. Uh, for my own books, you know, each, each book uh, has a very different set of requirements for myself that I put when I create a book. And that goes back to that intention of the book. And then I look at what is the, the best way for me to meet that intention of the book, whether it's through self-publishing or through trying to get it to, you know, to live through a traditional publisher. And, and maybe, Linda, you have more to say on that as well. No, not right now. That sounded, that, that was awesome. Okay, thank you, Alahe, for that. Um, yeah, it is a, a big, big process, the writing, the illustrating, and then the business side. So there's a whole lot that goes into it for sure. Um, we had a question. Um, I would like to join a writing workshop for writers of children's books. Does one exist? Um, this is a great question. Great feedback from, for us at the Baha'i Publishing Trust to think about putting something like that, that together specifically for Baha'i authors and illustrators. I'm sure there may be other um, children's, you know, writing workshops. I don't know, Linda and Alahe, if you've joined some workshops and want to share anything about that. One wonderful resource that I, I, I hope that friends know about, and if there's someone here on the call who has more um, has more of the historical background, please share it in the chat or in the questions. But when I, maybe um, maybe like five years ago, I attended a program at Greenacre Baha'i School called the Spirit of Children. Um, it was, it's like a yearly gathering of, it's not just for writers, but it's also for like artists and musicians. And it's for individuals who are just in, you know, love children and want to create materials for children. And I found that space to be so thrilling and so wonderful. It was a weekend, it was a whole week session. And, um, you know, we haven't, we haven't been agreeing, we haven't been having these programs, but I, I know that there's some discussion about like that group coming together again. And um, so I think we should uh, look out for that. And um, I think in addition though, I guess I, I, I'll just mention my experience there. It was like I had just written um, a story, the story about Fujita, and I, I shared it there. And the, the love, <laughs> the love and the joy and, you know, people who had met Fujita and people offered so much like support and enthusiasm. And I've, I met a lot of new people um, who are also writing and, you know, we've been able to share our drafts with one another. And so I, 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 I think it'd be incredible if, you know, things like that could be multiplied and maybe even like localized um, in, in our communities, because I think we, yeah, as I mentioned, I, I, I think the potential for collaboration is so great. Um, and I think we learn so much from consulting with one another that we, we just can't do in isolation. So I think any 
and any things that are organized both from the publishing trust, but maybe also like a few of us should experiment with it and learn what does it look like, you know, at the local level, at a regional level for, for uh, writers to come together. Yes, thank you. Um, yeah, hopefully we can continue to have future, future workshops and collaborations and things of this nature. This is great for us to think about. And also for those who don't know, there's other presentations throughout the weekend with other authors and panelists. So um, please attend those if you have interest as well. Um, we'll go to our next question. Oh, Allah, I just want to something? say uh, there's a lot of uh, comments in the uh, in the chat. So I hope people are looking in the chat as well about, you know, the spirit of children and things like that. Like some people are posting interesting information. And there's a lot of also groups outside and people offering private workshops as well. So I think if there is an interest, it is going to be one of the questions on the short survey after. And it could kind of give a sense of how many people are interested and whether or not that's something we're doing. So sometimes you have to just push and say, you know, we want this and uh, and see if anyone can make it happen. But there is a lot of options out there for, for learning about how to write children's book, how to illustrate the children's book and how to, you know, work on the process itself. So. Yes, thank you. And thank you everyone for who's sharing some thoughts in the chat as well. Um, let's see, we have another question. Um, Linda, this is for you first and maybe Allah, if you have other thoughts too. Uh, you're amazing in your ability to fuse the faith's guidance with your own storytelling ability and creative ideas. What are some of the challenges of doing research and deciding what to include in a story for children? And then if you also can um, tell us again, what biographies you're currently working on. Yeah, what a great question. Uh, so I think, I think I, I, I kind of mentioned, you know, like, like, let's say Fujita, like, you know, I, I actually like one thing, just like as a little idea that I, I was really excited. I didn't know that it was possible to do this, but someone suggested and I did, I wrote to the World Center and asked like, if there was anything in the archives related to Fujita. And it was so exciting to get a you know, response from the World Center. And they, they shared with me like maybe a list of like, I don't know, 15 books that you know, had like reference to Fujita. So I think in terms of like, it, I guess that was a challenge, like knowing like, am I, am, everything that's out there, like how, how can we make sure that we, as a, as a writer have at least read, even if we know we're not gonna include every detail of Fujita's life because it's in the end, like a short book. Um, but I, I was so grateful, you know, once again, as though we don't love the Universal House of Justice enough, like the opportunity to like have a letter from the House of Justice so quickly, you know, letting me um, you know, like all the books that we could find out more about Fujita. So that was very exciting. So I think, so that's one challenge. I think another challenge, I guess, is just deciding what to include. You know, there are so many stories, there are so many like, um, you know, but then you also then want to balance and, and the books that that I've worked on are actually on the longer end, you know, like actually are like 1500 words. I mean, there are some books for and that's because this is for older children, like in upper elementary school for younger children, when you have much fewer words, I think it becomes even more challenging deciding like what is like the one or two maybe concepts or stories that you want to include. Uh, one thing that like one way to address that, I think has been like, you know, many of the, um, and this is, this is in like in the broader literature too, like this is like a, a growing genre of books is about like children's picture biographies, you know, because more and more parents want their children at a young age to learn about, um, you know, they, they just want them to learn about people from the world. And so, I think that there's an opportunity in those books because often it's parents reading them to children. So like, you know, you can have like an author's notes or you can have like additional information at the back of the book. So I think the story could be left somewhat like simple, but then there's the opportunity to like include other like resources either online or in the book itself that the parent could sort of like use to supplement for like a curious child who wants to like learn more about that individual, some of those like that back information um, is also helpful. 
Um, and I think the other part of the question was some of the other projects. Um, we're, right now we're working on um, a story about Mullah Hussein and one about Thomas Breckwell and um, one about uh, Lewis Gregory and also one about Patricia Locke. And, but I'm always thinking of others. So if anyone has any ideas, please let me know. Because there are so many. I feel there's an endless number of you know, heroes and heroines to learn about and write about. Thank you. Um, here's another comment and question. Um, and maybe you can both talk about this. I think this is about representation in books. Um, in children's books, I see a lot of pictures of white people and black people and others, but I never see books of stories of a Hispanic child involved in a story. Hispanics are the largest minority population in the United States. Um, and there are no children's books where Hispanic children are one of the main characters. I hope anything about writing a book about the heroes of the faith, we can they can see themselves in stories that Hispanic children can relate to. Um, so I know some books are translated into Spanish, but that's not the same thing as being a character in the story. So maybe if you have any comments, either you specifically about um, representing representing um, Hispanic populations in books. Absolutely, I, I, I don't think uh, any either one of us would agree, disagree with your comment. I think there is a need for representation, and you know the fact that you are more sensitive to it probably means that you are also the right person to do something about it and put those stories out there. And I think we each write with our own angles and our own perceptiveness. And, um, you know, when we feel a certain way about something, it also means that we have an ability to see a special need. And I think just the fact that you brought it up, uh, you know, it means that there is a voice missing and uh, whatever can be done to, to make sure that voice is heard is something that, you know, we all need to hear more often, you know, and be reminded of. But also, I would encourage you to, to voice that even more and to, you know, maybe if you feel, if, if you are a writer yourself or uh, someone who is interested in children's book to see how to make that happen. So thank you for sharing that. Yes, I concur with Elaha, and I, I'm, I'm glad you mentioned it and I will keep it in my heart as well going forward. Thank you. Um, and I'm realizing we're getting some comments in the chat and I'm realizing maybe not everyone can see them, that it's just going to the panelists. I'm sorry about that. Um, I don't know that I personally know how to change that right now. So I'll just try to, I, a few people just shared, you know, about attending the spirit of the children conference and that that's been a really positive experience. Um, let me see. Um, Austin, Texas has a place called the writing barn with some fantastic programs for writers of children's books. So it sounds like that's another resource if people are looking for workshop style things and some are online as well so that's called the writing barn in austin texas i'm not familiar with it i'm just reading someone's comment um let's see um if we had any other questions here um i know we have also let's see sorry Oh, here's another, here's a question I see. Please share how you match an intention for, no, for one of your books to this decision about which venue you choose for publishing, a self or traditional publishing house. So I guess, how do you choose in terms of each book, what path to take? Elaha, do you wanna go first? Yeah, because I kind of feel like it's a follow up to to what I was saying earlier. Uh, I'll give you an example. You know, when uh, I decided to when Chelsea and I decided to work on this story and about, you know, the the quote, basically mining your inner gem and how education and, you know, we decided to. Really focus on the inspiration from the Baha'i writings. And, you know, like finding our teaching that, you know, our gems were our virtues and stuff. So it's really about 
virtues and, you know, mining our inner gem. And so for this book, for example, which could have potentially been submitted to the Baha'i Publishing Trust, because the topic is so general, um, you know, we decided to self-publish it ourselves so that I could sell it on my Plant Love Grow website and Chelsea could also sell it on her Moment Today website and we could easily sell it on Amazon as well. So for this book, for example, it was very a very easy decision based on the intention of putting the book to as many people as possible and, you know, working through our own distribution, so, you know, networks. But because of the, the topic, we were also able to, you know, contact Ariana and see if they wanted to carry the book as well. So if, for example, um, you know, at the beginning when these board books were created, um, it was very hard for me to, at, at the time, to think about, you know, creating my own board books. It, board books are a very specific type of product that you you can't buy like three board books. You have to, you know, order a thousand board books. So if you are looking at creating a board book and it's your first book, for example, then working with a Baha'i publishing house or with a traditional publishing house will support that process without you having to invest you know, a certain amount of money uh, to make it happen. If you are, you know, further, 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 further into your career and you have enough distribution, you know, contacts and things like that, then you can decide for yourself if you, you know, want to take the risk of, of creating your own books. So just to give you an idea uh, of what to do, what is great about, you know, working with a traditional publishing house is, they have their own distribution, they have their own the marketing, they have their own publishing process. And, you know, for me, especially with the Baha books that have Baha'i content, I feel like it's, it's more supported, you know, through the traditional publishing house, especially when you are at the beginning of, of writing your, your own books, of getting known in a way as someone who has written books, if you don't want to invest in a website and all of that. So kind of thinking like, where do I see these books in my head? Who do they, who are they written for? That, and then work backwards and, and see what the process is. I hope I answered it. Yeah, thank you. Um, okay, so there's, um, I think it's sort of two related questions I'm going to string together. One is general and the other specific. One says, do either of you have a mentor or do you have thoughts about sort of the mentoring process? And then one sort of semi-related that's more specific. It says, hi, my father is blessed to become a knight of Baha'u'llah in Southwest Africa and an official photographer for the first Universal House of Justice, the archives and other Baha'i earlier events that have many audio tapes. I'm not sure how to start a storybook or what type, who could I consult with? Um, so that one, I just want to put out the Baha'i Publishing Trust, but also Linda and Allah, hey, maybe you can just sort of talk about that process of mentorship, collaboration. How do you start? How, who do you reach out to? Those type of things. I can start. Um, I think, yeah, I, I feel like I've, yeah, I, I think a, a lot of, I, I can't think of w one particular mentor I've had, but I, I think that the spirit of children uh, put me in touch with a lot of children's books, children, you know, other authors. Uh, so that was uh, some of them I knew before, like some of them I knew as a child and as a youth. And so it was exciting to, um, you know, connect with them like in this way. And they have um, so lovingly like read drafts and that has been like a source of great joy. I, I think um, I also like feel like, you know, I, th I think it is really helpful to have, I mean, Allah has had much more experience than I do, but I feel like especially the first few like months when I was writing and I wasn't sure like, you know, how long things should be and you know, like, what should the tone be? You know, I, I feel like having um, individuals, I, they, they weren't mentors as such, but I think I just identified people around me and I was very conscious for it to be a diverse group of people, like some Baha'is, some, you know, there's a local bookstore that we have 
that my kids kind of grew up in that bookstore. And because I, I felt so strongly that, you know, that the stories, these stories don't just belong to Baha'i children and it's not just their identity that can be shaped by learning about the heroes and heroines of the faith, but it's all children. So I was very conscious of like wanting the books to not have like too much Baha'i jargon so that they would be unaccessible. And so like, it was hard like sharing, like there, there is like an author who I really love here locally. She isn't a Baha'i. She also writes children's books and, you know, sharing with her, you know, like, you know, sharing with her the books, it was very helpful because she asked questions like, what is a letter of the living? And then having to like, you know, use language that, you know, like explained, you know, like the significance of being among the early, the first 18 to believe in the new manifestation of God. Like, of course we can explain that. But if I had just shared it with mentors or friends who were Baha'is, I may not have had that opportunity to really think about how to um, explain things to like a wider uh, group of individuals. Um, yeah, but I think it is really good to have a mentor. Like, I, I, I'm not sure, like, I, I think it's so personal, you know, I think either among someone that we already know, uh, like for me, like my dad, who, you know, doesn't write for children, but, you know, is like very, very like excited about writing and literature. Like, I, I find it's someone who, you know, is excited about what I'm doing. And I think having someone like that, who is um, kind of in your corner <laughs> and sort of like cheering you on, I think is um, tremendously important. Um, and I think Elaha and I would both, if, you know, if, if there's anyone who would like, you know, beyond this session, like, you know, to have more conversations, to hear about other Baha'i authors or other authors that we know about, I think we both would welcome the opportunity to assist anyone who, you know, is interested in having that uh, those kind of consultations. I think that's a great answer. And the only thing I'm going to say is, for me, it's change a different part of my process. You know, whenever, especially at the very beginning, it was more of a kind of a writer's group exchange. And I think that's a really, really great thing where you support each other through your writing. Uh, further along, it became also more of a specific thing where I would seek specific people uh, to value their feedback. And I think you need to know also what it is that you want out of it, out of the process. Uh, you know, like if it's more structural in terms of the writing, you know, length, tone, uh, grammar, you know, that kind of support, or if it's more uh, inspirational, or if it's to kind of keep you on track. So having an idea of what it is that you want to get out of the process is great. And in terms of mentoring, it's really much more of a give and take process a lot of time where you you get as much as you you give as part of the process. So, you know, go out there and definitely find people who who are kind of in the same place as you and, and who will want to explore more together. It's a really rewarding process. Thank you. I think I'm just... I'm going to put out one final question for you guys to answer, and then I think we'll wrap it up. We're, we're coming to time. And um, again, a poll should be coming out in the chat from the Wilmette Institute, just for some very brief feedback. Um, so our final question today, and of course, if anyone still has questions, feel free to try to reach out to any of us um, through the Baha'i Publishing Trust, Linda Alahe through the Wilmette Institute, and we'll try to get back to you. Um, it says, what steps do you take during the writing and review process to ensure representation and diversity? I'm wondering if you seek out editors who are members of communities you might be representing, but not part of yourselves, and how do you navigate that in general? So Linda or Alahe, if you have some thoughts. Yeah, I, I I think it's something that I I think Allah also um, I think I think it's something that is um, I I don't know if there's many things more important than that and so I, I I I'm trying and I think this is like where it's also like we want to like be conscious to know that we also are growing <laughs> like we're also God willing getting better at this year by year and month by month uh, and I think it's important like as you mentioned like at every level you know from the, the idea, like from the, the idea, from the um, who, who we like asked to review, 
like, you know, who we kind of collaborate with, like identifying an illustrator. Um, like I was really excited, like the, 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 the book that George Ronald published about uh, Fujita, like it was so thrilling to have an illustrator who is from Japan. And, you know, I think that, you know, I often like thought about what, what the, the, the spirit, you know, cause I think like the spirit of, you know, like he is, like a he, he is an ancestor to all of us but you know she like had grown up in a country where Fujita was someone that everyone knew and everyone loved so I think the opportunity to have an illustrator who was also like you know like had grown up learning about Fujita and loving Fujita I think was a very precious addition to the project and then of, of course I think in terms of like then when we're marketing we have to also be conscious that we you know want the books and I think I love that Allah had mentioned the price you know I think we want we want our books to be, you know, tremendously accessible. We want all of the literature that's produced. You know, ultimately this is made not for a subgroup of children, it's for all children. So th being very deliberate about how we can ensure that that happens, I think is central to, I think it's, I think it's an imperative that we have as creators of literature. I'm just gonna add, you pretty much said it all, but just to, this process of working with other people. And, you know, I work with different editors that I pay. I work with uh, translators that I pay. I work with, uh, you know, like people that I feel can really look at the work that I do with sometimes a different time, uh, a different mindset. Um, I've also been challenged about my own biases at time. And, and uh, there is a book that I've completely redone you know, because when I got a certain feedback at one point, I realized, oh, my God, I, I've never looked at it from that point of view. And, and, you know, when that happens, you know, we learn a lot and we realize we are doing our best, but it, it does help the process sometimes to, to get feedback and to work with people who have different experience. So that is definitely something that I, I would always encourage to anyone you know, if you can, is get the right set of eyes on whatever it is you create and find the right people to, to work with, because that's very important. Okay, thank you so much, Alahe and Linda. I think we are going to wrap up. I'll just mention, I hope people can see in the chat. I know some people have posted like their email addresses and stuff and have mentioned, you know, Baha'i writers groups and things like that. I'm not going to go through and read all of them. There are quite a few at this point, but I hope people can see that. There was a question, I know, just about getting in touch with um, either Linda or Alahe. I don't know if you want to share um your email address or anything like that in the chat. If people have specific questions, you know, about projects they're writing on, working on or things like that. Um, but yeah, I just want to say, I really appreciate Alahe and Linda. Thank you for sharing your presentations and your insight and your experiences. And of course, thank you. Thank you to everyone who showed up this morning and joined us and listened and shared questions and thoughts. Um, we just were so happy to have you join us. And, you know, this, this weekend collaboration of presentations with the Baha'i Publishing Trust and the Wilmette Institute is going on all weekend. So um, each presentation will go over different topics. So if you're interested in other kinds of things, please check those out as well. And um, yeah, that's all. We're, we're just very grateful. Um, thank you for joining us. And we're just about to finish up the poll too. So okay. we're at 75% done. So if the last, oh gosh, 10 people or so would uh, fill that out, that would be excellent. And all the presenters would very much enjoy that, I think, and knowing how to serve you guys more in the future. Yes, thank you. We would love to hear feedback. So, you know, we can offer more programs in the future for those who are interested. Um, and thank you, Boyd, uh, for hosting and helping with the chat and the, the poll and all of those great things. Um, so yeah, I think that's all for now. Thank you everyone. And uh, hopefully we'll see you at some other point this weekend at, at another one of our weekend sessions. Thank you very much. Bye.